Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Michigan Chronicle Small Business Toolkit 2021 Virtual Roundtable. Uh, my name is Charity Dean, and I'm going to be your host for today. I'm really excited to be here with some wonderful partners um, as we help gear up to uh, prepare small businesses for what's to come. And so first, I want to thank you uh, for joining us and thank all of our presenting partners of uh, the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation and Detroit Needs Business. Um, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, the Detroit Regional Chamber, and a thank you to our supporting partner, Flagstar Bank. Uh, so before we get into the questions, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the panelists and allow them to introduce themselves. So first, we'll start with Lily. Why don't you introduce yourself, and uh, and then we'll go from there. Hi, Lily. Hi, Charity. Good to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lily Hamburger, and I am the Director of Small Business Attraction and Retention with the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, and really glad to be here to discuss um, the ways that we are supporting small businesses in our community. Thank you, Lily. Dawn. Hi, Charity. Hi, everyone. I thank you for this opportunity. My name is Dawn Sanford, and I'm the owner of Shoes and Shaves, Barber and Spa in your community. Thank you, Dawn. So happy to have you. Uh, Willie, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Charity. Good afternoon. My name is Willie Brake. I am the founder of All About Technology, located here in Detroit, Michigan. Thank you for having coming on, uh, Willie. And then last but not least, my dear friend Bernard. Hello. Hey, Charity, how are you? Hello to my other panelists. Uh, grateful to be here. Bernard Parker III, Director of Government Relations for Detroit Regional Chamber. Awesome. Uh, so let's just get right into it. And so uh, my first question, um, I, I hope that all of you can answer. Um, so, you know, we know how much the pandemic has impacted small businesses, right? As local, state, and federal agencies continue to strive to provide critical tools and capital to business owners and their employees. Um, we wanna know what programs and tools have you found most helpful uh, from the American Rescue Plan? And what do you think we can build upon as we move through the second year of this pandemic? And Willie, I'm gonna start with you and then uh, anyone else that wants to answer. Uh, so, so what programs have you found successful and what should we be looking for in the, as we go into the second year of this pandemic, Willie? Uh, obviously the grants have been very helpful as well as the other financing, such as the EIDL uh, loans and the Paycheck Protection Program. I think going forward, in order for small businesses to recover, we're gonna need uh, more support from uh, the community. Uh, I wanna say more support, more support from uh, businesses and corporations as well. So that's gonna mean that in order for small businesses to survive, we're gonna need uh, contract, purchase orders, invoices, things of that sort, so that small businesses can continue to be sustainable and keep their doors open uh, and keep their employees uh, working. Great. Uh, Don, what about you? Saying uh, the Detroit means business has been great. Uh, DEGC, -E all the grants that's coming through the PPP, everything that's offered, you know, that can sustain us, we have been using and resources and they need to, uh, like Willie was saying, for the community to continue to support and um, come through. So, Lily, we know you've been in the small business space for a while. What do you think of some tools and, and programs that have been most helpful during this time? And also, what do we need to be thinking about going into the second year? Yes, thank you, Charity. I definitely agree with what Willie and Don shared that the grants and financial tools have been absolutely essential. Everyone has lost revenue during this time, and so those financial supports are critical. Something that I think we can do better on is making the information about those tools and grants much simpler, easier to access, and more available to everybody, whether you are digitally connected and on the SBA's newsletter and checking their website all the time, or you've never applied for a loan before or a grant before, um, just providing the support for people to be able to have all their documentation in order and to be ready for that funding when it does become available. So that's what I think we can look for as we move into this second year. Yeah, good point. Bernard, what about you? Um, the PP loans were excellent, the second draw loans. But one of the things I like to see moving forward, 
uh, coming from a government relations perspective is to have more of our elected leaders really get involved in understanding what faces our micro and small businesses. Uh, personally, we've heard so many horror stories at the chamber about folk not, um, uh, not getting calls returned back, not really understanding the paperwork, not knowing who to go to, um, and really time is of the essence. And so we could get more of those folks involved as, as they start to release these monies, I think things will be a lot better. Yeah, thank you. You know, I heard a, a number of you mentioned the, the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP. Uh, so to the small business owners, Don and Willie, did you receive a PPP loan? And if so, or if not, you know, how was the process? Did you face any obstacles? Tell us about that experience. I did actually today or last night receive my PPP. Oh, well, congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. However, uh, you know, grateful, so grateful and thankful to everyone that participated into getting it done uh, from Detroit means business really, really, really took care of some business on this one. This is the second draw. First one was a little easier. The second one, I mean, it provoked every emotion that I had to get this done. Yeah. So for it to come through today, it's it's a it, it was something. I, the roller coaster from the wrong forms being filled out to so it, it's a lot of work that needs to be uh, overhauled. I think they need to simplify it by. If you already been through just a few questions to ask, you know, especially when you have your forgiveness letter, everything is in order. Documentation is there, everything you need. The second one should have been much simpler, just a mm. simple, you know, whatever that three question or four questions you need to know as far as bringing them up to date with where you are. Yeah. Something basic and simple instead of going through your whole thing, filling out the wrong forms not finding out until it's closed it was closed the ppp closed when i found out that i didn't get it so it's just yeah. about a, yeah yeah so every emotion this time would so, and i can only think about the people that don't have these entities in place to assist them to get here yeah. so it was yeah we need some more education and uh i think a liaison that sees them through check and balance wise to yeah. get them to that finish line yep that's good feedback uh tell us about it willie did you apply for ppp uh yes we did and the process for us was pretty straightforward uh because we had relationships uh with the bank already and okay. also having access to having our paperwork already together uh thanks to you know participating in these small business programs that were out there that kind of forced me to get my paperwork together, that when it was time to apply for the grants, the loans, the PPP, everything was, you know, pretty easy because you had all of this information at your disposal. Uh, I think it was a huge challenge for those that didn't have their uh, taxes filed, their paperwork together, you know, it made it a lot harder. So, you know, as we always say, if you uh, stay ready, then you don't have to get ready. So that really helped us. Uh, you know, in this pandemic. Yeah. Um, so my next question is for Bernard and Lily. Um, as you thinking about, you know, through your work and working with businesses, what are some activities that businesses should start or continue that will help strengthen their business as restrictions are loosening? As you know, um, especially in Michigan, July 1st, um, a lot of the restrictions are, 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 are loosening and uh, we're opening kind of back up. You know, what are things that businesses need to start or continue to do that will help strengthen them um, as we go into this next phase. Lily? Sure. I um, I am really excited about the opportunity for folks to reopen and sort of invite their customers back in in person. And I would say the number one thing I would suggest is keeping in touch with your customers. Let them know what's going on with your place of business, what they can expect when they're coming in or shopping with you online, what is changing about your business, and let them know that you want them there, you want to keep them, that your customers are, are valued by your business. Um, I would definitely encourage business owners to take a look at um, the employee retention tax credit that is is coming down now. Um, that is a, a new um, 
opportunity for us. We, we definitely want to get information out about the employee retention tax credit. Take a look if you're eligible. Um, and then think about the safety aspects. Um, COVID is, is not gone, but the um, ability to kind of re-engage a society now that there's vaccines available and we kind of know how to deal with the virus with masks and everything, um, continue to help your customers, your staff stay safe and um, definitely have that um, preparedness plan still in place. And that's a huge part of, of, of what you need to communicate with your customers so that they feel safe, they know what to expect coming into your businesses. And then um, lastly, just make sure that you know the resources that are available to help you. I appreciate that Dawn has mentioned Detroit Means Business a couple of times. If you haven't been to the website, DetroitMeansBusiness.org, um, go and, and look at the resources that are available there, whether it's financial resources, experts to help guide you with a problem you may be facing with your business, information about safety regulations. Um, that is definitely something that we want to share and um, get your feedback on. And you can um, get one-on-one -on -one help through our call center as well. Bernard. You have to echo some of the things that Lily is saying is, is that for me, it would be marketing, right? Let folk know that you're open. Um, and and these, are, these are things that don't cost a lot. We all keep email addresses. Email your customers and let them know. Stay on top of the latest rules and things that are coming up from MIOSHA. I know it's a shameless plug for the Detroit Regional Chamber. We, we keep real time in terms of all the things that are happening with MIOSHA. And Charity, as you know, things change every day. So if we, the folk that are in this field, if you are, get confused, I can only imagine how you know, Ms. Dawn and Mr. Willie will feel just trying to catch up on the latest things and run a business. You know, be be proactive. Get out with some of your colleagues and find out some of the latest things that they're doing. How are they getting the word out? Um, a, a lot of it, it doesn't cost a lot, but it, it does cost a little extra time. You know, COVID has, has done a job on us all, but if it's worth it, you'll get out and do it. So, yeah, thank you. So Willie and Don, I have a, another question for you. So, you know, uh, we are a year and a half, well, a year and a couple of months um, into the pandemic. Um, talk to us about what steps or innovations that you've taken to put your business in the best position to thrive. Talk about also some of the things that you're hearing for, from some of your colleagues and, and counterparts. And I'll start with you, Don. Taking this by being productive, which is trying to focus on our methods of thriving and being productive, following the safety guidelines, and really talking to our neighbors and our co-workers, our co-laborers on the, I'm on the avenue of fashion, uh, just keeping up with one another and, and keeping them informed, keeping each other informed, uh, keeping our clients informed. We're, we're basically focusing on the, the thriving, you know, trying to uh, maintain with the CDC guidelines and doing those type of things. Okay. Willie, what about you? Okay. Uh, building on what Bernard was saying, building on what Bernard was saying earlier, uh, we've taken those extra steps to let people know that we are open because we did not have to close during the pandemic. Uh, being the critical infrastructure, we were open during the pandemic. Um, we uh, also, you know, accommodated our customers. We were very, uh, customer service is something that we really focus on uh, during this uh, pandemic. We were doing that by allowing customers to set appointments, uh, offering curbside service and things like that. And as far as, uh, you know, supporting each other and getting information out to each other, there is a Facebook group out there for all of the uh, retailers. Uh, I think it's called COVID-19 Support Group. And it's a lot of uh, retailers, uh, government officials, and things like that that share information uh, and offer support to small businesses. So that has been very helpful as well. Are you referring to the, uh, I think it's the Rapid Response COVID-19 group on Facebook? That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. So shameless plug, um, Rachel Luft and I started that when COVID first hit. So yes, it's a, it's a group. It's a, for, for business owners in Detroit on Facebook, uh, Rapid Response, and, and you're right, there's lots of folks in there giving information out uh, to small businesses regularly. So glad to, glad to hear that, that you're utilizing that, uh, Lily. Uh, so my next question is gonna be for Bernard and Lily. 
And uh, let me just make sure I, I have it uh, correctly here. So coming out of the pandemic, right? So, you know, we're going, you know, things are opening up, you know, small businesses still have struggles, of course, but mm -hmm. specifically what plans to support uh, does Detroit Means Business and the, the DGC and the Detroit Regional Chamber have that is designed to support urban entrepreneurship and more specifically black owned businesses? Well, I'll tell you this. One of the things that I'm very proud of, Charity, and you know this is working uh, uh, on the Racial Justice and Economic Equity uh, Steering Committee for the Detroit Regional Chamber. One of the reasons why that was created was coming out of the whole George Floyd thing. But then also we found that, that, that as things start to evolve, um, as we come out of uh, COVID, um, there's a huge amount of disparity that's truly been uh, uncovered. And we knew it was all there, but I think COVID has, has sort of put the cherry on the top. And so as we make sure that we not only get more engaged with our small businesses, we're putting more information on our website to let folk know, very proud to, to tell folks that we're, we're also engaged with Detroit Means Business. And we're finding out internally what can we do to help these businesses? Uh, the chamber has anywhere between two to 3,000 members uh, going from micro business all the way up to your Fords, your Barton Mallows, um, your Henry Fords. How can we get those businesses that are small and micro engaged with larger businesses, start some procurement processes and things of that nature, get folk to start to talk to folk and to create those relationships where you start revenue and really assist with the plan of, of getting the small and micro businesses out there on the platform. Lily. Yeah, so this is really central to what my team is trying to do at the DEGC and integrating with the Detroit Means Business Coalition now that um, there have been services available for small businesses in Detroit, um, but we really have work ahead of us to make sure that everyone knows about them. And that's something that we're trying to do as a coalition and just to make sure that information is universally accessible and, and out there, not just digitally, but, but going door to door recently when the Restaurant Revitalization Fund came down from the SBA. We organized some volunteers to go out with the district business liaisons who are employees of the DGC and, and go door to door to food establishments that may be eligible for that program. And I really think that we reached people that may not have heard of that opportunity otherwise. So we want to make sure people know about the services and resources that are available, number one. But then we also know that there are gaps, that there are not, um, we don't have everything covered and we need to start to fill in some of those things. So we have lofty goals around mentorship, around funding, around creating opportunities for small business owners to get contracts, um, whether it's with government agencies or with private companies and reducing some of the regulatory barriers that we know exist for our small businesses. But this is all about doing this in collaboration and elevating the needs and the voice of, of small businesses so that um, we're all kind of working towards removing some of these big barriers together. Um, and I think that the devil is in the details in a lot of ways. Um, you know, if, if you don't have your taxes filed, like Willie mentioned earlier, um, if you don't have your paperwork together to be able to apply for a grant, um, how do we create a system where um, you know, always being ready is 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 the is the truth for everybody. And so we want to um, improve the existing services to make sure that everyone's bases are being covered in that regard. Um, just so that you know, no one can say I didn't know about this program or I didn't have the chance to apply or I didn't receive the help. We want to make sure that that the information and the services are are reaching everyone. And we're not going to do that alone. We're going to do it do it in partnership with. Um, you know, Bernard and his organization, with you, Charity, your organization, with all the small business services uh, organizations focusing together and, and marching towards uh, the same goals. Thank you, really great answer. And it's so, so important that intentionality um, that both you and Bernard spoke of. So that, that's really great. Um, so back to our small business owners, Willie and John, as you think about um, recovery and post-recovery, are there other sources of funding that you would consider beyond a PPE loan, such as micro loan or 7A from the SBA or express loans that you think would help your business pivot operations toward recovery and post recovery after this crisis? We'll start with you, Willie. Okay. I think more than anything, we need uh, access to opportunities. Uh, 
I like what Bernard was saying about engaging uh, the big businesses with the smaller and micro businesses. That would be a great partnership. That would be something that could take small business to the next level so that they can thrive and, I mean, go from just surviving to thriving as well. Uh, you'll be able to hire more people, increase your capacity, and things like that. That is very important. We've been an MBE for you know a number of years now, but for some reason, we have not been able to uh, uh, compete to the point where we can get awarded a contract. Uh, we are one of the few computer stores in Detroit. We have a, a niche operation, the way that we take in uh, refurbished computers and we redeploy them to nonprofit organizations, individuals, uh, veterans and seniors and things like that. Uh, so for all of the people that couldn't afford a computer uh, during the pandemic, they could come to All About Technology and get one for only 200 bucks. And that's something that we've been doing for a very long time. You know, So to be able to build a partnership with uh, the bigger businesses, we can take their electronic waste hire more people, interns, some interns, whatever the case may be, and get those computers into the hands of those that need them the most. And that way we can uh, continue to build that bridge to make technology affordable and accessible for all. Hmm. That's great. Don. Uh oh, I think you need to unmute yourself. There we go. I could not agree more with that, the exposure part, because that is vital, uh, getting the exposure out. But um, long term, yeah, yeah, I consider different uh, loan grants, even line of credit. I'm two years in. Well, on, I'm almost two years in. So just learning the paths to take and what's best for us, but exposure, getting us out there, hiring, those type of things are, are, are I think, are in the forefront for loans because you can get the loans and still have to, you know, get there. So that's Thank it. you, Don. Mm -hmm. So my next question is about e-commerce and, and, you know, when everything shut down last March, you know, we all found ourselves in a, a place of uncertainty. So uh, this question is for any of the panelists. Um, how important is e-commerce to surviving and thriving through the pandemic and how do we make it accessible? So, so Cherry, let, let me ask this. Let me answer this first, if I may. So, e-commerce. When you talked about uh, business to consumer, business to business, consumer to business, or even consumer to consumer, because of COVID, we found that businesses really can thrive in more of an innovative way. Um, and I hate the word, if if you will, and it's such a hate is such a strong word, out of the box thinking, because everyone that went into business obviously had an out of box aha moment and created a business. But the innovative way is to really start to look at your business, figure out how I can get to the folk that are utilizing my business, how I can raise revenue and sustain business. Uh, E-commerce e is something that's that's not new, right? We, we do it during Christmas when we get online and buy gifts for our, for our family. We do it Black Friday and when we take advantage of some of the deals. But right now, because of COVID and everyone's sort of still inside, working remotely, um, they want to go touchless. This is a great way to really reinvent yourself, if you can, through your goods and services and really make a great opportunity and make some money. Yeah. Other comments? I, I'd love to add on to what Bernard just shared. I think he's right, right on point. I do think that e-commerce is going to look different depending on what type of business you run. So if you're a retailer, it's gonna look like, you know, selling your product, putting a picture of your product on your website and making sure that someone can put in a credit card number and, and buy that product in some way, shape or form from you. But for Dawn, you know, you're running a salon, you're running a spa, what does e-commerce look like for you? It may look like that you're pivoting to sell some kind of product, like I was just mentioning, but it may mean that you have to have an online booking system that's new or something that tells customers, you know, how long the wait time is or when they can get in in a COVID safe manner into the salon. And, and so I, that's what I mean when I say it looks different depending on what business type you have. And um, I, I'm so interested to hear Willie's perspective running a, a computer business, a technology business, because I think the digital divide is just, 
you know, the elephant in the room here. We have to make sure that everyone has access to these tools and knows how to use them. And that goes for business owners, staff and customers alike. So that's something that I think as a community, we've really got to tackle is, is how do we get everybody the access and the acumen to be able to do business in this way, no matter what type of business you have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so building on what Lily was saying, um, I think uh, depending on the type of business that you have, uh, e-commerce is gonna look different for everyone. Uh, we use e-commerce, but being that we're in the city and a lot of our customers are not computer literate, we could not totally depend on e-commerce. So uh, we still had to print out, you know, the items that we had available so the people that did not feel comfortable coming in, you know, we had a, you know, paper catalog that we could deliver to their car and they could check off what they want and go from there. Uh, I think uh, it was kind of frustrating for me uh, during the pandemic to drive out to a restaurant only to find out that they were only taking online orders mm -hmm. and then they were adding on all, all of these different taxes and things like that, you know, just to be able to support their restaurant. So I think e-commerce should not be your only, you know, tool in the toolbox that you should have uh, other things as well to be able to accommodate your customer and survive, you know, in order to survive during the pandemic. Yeah, I think, you know, Willie, that's a really great point. You know, the digital divide is very real. And so we have to be careful when we talk about pivoting to e-commerce um, to make sure that that conversation is also about accessibility and how are we making sure that folks aren't left out, um, but also acknowledge the very real uh, times that, that we live in. And, and that's a delicate balance. And so uh, I appreciate hearing the ways in which uh, will you were able to to pivot and do paper catalogs? Don, do you have thoughts about the e-commerce, especially considering, uh, you know, your your beauty salon? Yes, well, yes. It uh, to Lily's point, we do have a POS system that we use in the e-commerce part with, and uh, during the shutdown, we were able to get out some gift certificates through our e-commerce, uh, so that helped. And just learning how it works. Uh, product now we have products so we're, we're uh, trying to get that uploaded on e-commerce so and get that word out but yeah we're just navigating through it now so it's it's a helpful tool and it's a necessary tool though although it's not the end all to be all it is a necessary tool i'm, I'm learning um so it does help yes so my my next question uh oh bernard go ahead I, I had a um, quick flashback. We talked in their prior lives charity about the digital divide. And, and if you think about it, particularly for our small businesses, when we talk about TA or technical assistance, remember we talked about lawyers and marketing and accounting for mm -hmm. from our small businesses. The digital divide is also right there now because times have changed. And to just encourage many of our businesses while they say they don't have time, they are going to have to really realize how important utilizing that computer is. Whether it's getting on your iPhone, your iPad, a laptop. I mean, that right now is 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 going to be fundamental, just like a credit card or a debit card. Mm -hmm. So that's that's yep. something we're going to have to figure out. Yeah. Um, so this question is going to be for Bernard and Lily. Um, think about your organizations, um, Detroit Regional Chamber, Detroit Means Business, Detroit DDC. Um, what is, and so we've got some small businesses that are watching right now, right? And, and they took some time to log in to this panel because they wanted some tools, right? As they navigated COVID. So what is one thing, and I'll start with you, Lily. What is one thing that your organization has to offer today uh, for small businesses, uh, your best kept secret or, or some tool uh, that, uh, a small business owners who's watching right now can take advantage of today and then how do they access it? And so I'll start with you, Lily, and then we'll go to you, Bernard. So uh, I'll, I'll start um, I'll start with the expert guidance because there is free one-on-one -on -one consulting available through Detroit Means Business, and I believe it is really underutilized. You can get help on anything from accounting to writing a job description 
if you're hiring, if you need help, just kind of thinking about how to pivot your business and strategically looking at how to make money during the pandemic, there are experts available to help you. And so to make an appointment with one of those experts, you can go to DetroitMeansBusiness.org under expert guidance, and you should be able to make an appointment right there. If you're somebody who would rather speak to someone on the phone, um, you can call Detroit Means Business as well. And I am going to um, pull up the phone number so that I can so I can read it on the air as well. Um, but we want to make sure that everyone is getting access to that expert help because it is free. Um, and so the phone number, if you prefer that method of making an appointment, is 844 844- 333-8249. And that's to the Detroit Means Business Helpline that can get you um, to the expert guidance. So that's the best kept secret I'll share. Thank you, Lily. Renard. Ready? I, I don't know if we necessarily have a best kept secret, but what I would say is our website is really user friendly. You know, we okay. have real time update information about COVID, myosias, because we represent businesses. Um, when you talk about some of our events and webinars and things that are coming up, um, when you talk about just being able to access um, um, uh, future opportunities and things of that nature on our website, I mean, that's that's key. And again, I, I would suggest to folks, if you don't have a computer, you got to figure it out because right now everything is so digital, you miss out. So, so what's right? the website where folks can go and get that um information bernard www.detroitchamber.com um you should be able to pull that up again it's very user friendly you can click on whatever you need to click on and keep it moving awesome so my next question then similarly is to willie and don and that my question for you for the two of you are what is something that you know now that has helped you in your business that you did not know before the pandemic started. So something that you know now that has helped your business survive that you did not know before the pandemic began. What is that? And I'm going to go to you, Dawn, first, and then Willie. Um, and, and the point of these questions is or give our, our viewers and our listeners some really tangible things they can use today. So, Dawn, what's something you know now that you did not know uh, when the pandemic started? For your business one of the things i can say that i know now is that there is resources help whatever it is that you need there are people there you're not alone in anything in any area if you're an entrepreneur you do have a support system and i did not know that before the pandemic it took the pandemic for me to learn that because i truly opening up my doors uh in august pandemic hits in march so on the fast track learning. So learn that there are people there that really have compassion and can really get to you, get you to what you need. So one of the things I learned is to dig deep into your tackle box as well as your toolbox. So, mm -hmm. and uh, the resources that you need are available. That's why. Well, I'll, I'll say this Dawn to your point before the, and, and you're absolutely right. There are resources available. But don't don't be so hard on yourself. It was the pandemic that really forced a lot of these partners to come together and say, "How do we come uh, to help our small business?" So, yeah. so uh, you're not alone in, in that. Uh, I, Willie, okay. oh, go ahead, Don. I was just gonna say I, I learned the strength that I had and the uh, resilience and the fight and just keep fighting, keep plugging away, and just don't give up on your dreams and your thoughts. You can do this. I learned that I am stronger than I thought. So. Yes, you are, man. Yes, you are, Dawn. Oh. Willie, what's one thing that you know now that has helped your business that you did not know before the pandemic? Uh, I would say uh, survival techniques. I feel like if you can survive the pandemic, you can survive anything. Um, you know, we went a long time without access to any help, any funding, and so forth. So when the funding started to come as a result of the pandemic, uh, we were able to get uh, stronger. And we used that strength to increase our inventory to be able to help more people. Uh, the pandemic reminded me of why All About Technology was founded. Uh, it allowed, it showed us that we are 
so badly needed in Detroit, you know, to help build, bridge that digital divide. So that has been very important for us. And that's why we want to continue to uh, grow and thrive and also uh, replicate the retail store that we have on Michigan Avenue and bring it to other targeted neighborhoods as well. Well, that's awesome. So we, when we first started, we were talking about the grants and the loans that came out, um, specifically PPP. And so just want to circle back to the PPP conversation. I know Lily and Bernard, your organizations helped connect people to that resource. And, and Willie and Dawn, you access the resource. So this question is really for all four of you. Um, for those that received PPP loans, if they're watching, if we've got small business owners that are watching and received PPP loans, any tips or warnings for them as they uh, want to receive the loan and also also have to go back for the through the forgiveness process. Any tips, words of, of wisdom? You know, what do they need to be thinking about and doing and to be to be ready? You know, Charity, right. uh, that's a great question. Coming from the government relations side of the chamber, we've had a huge debate on taxes, right? Specifically, state of Michigan, the federal government, and 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 I would tell folks that as you get these loans really understand the nuances of these loans, how or if you have to pay them back, how is it going to put you in a different tax bracket for your company, for your employees, for you as the owner? I mean, really, really dig into this stuff because again, I mean, it's great that they're giving you loans to, to try to mitigate out of COVID, but it doesn't make any sense that the minute you get out of COVID and you save your business, you get hit with a huge tax bill from the federal government and you feel like you're back in COVID all over again. So that, that that's my suggestion. Yeah, that's a really good, it's an excellent point, uh, understanding tax implications. Mm -hmm. What else? Okay. I was gonna say, go ahead, Don. You're speaking to a PPP. Uh, just, just make sure you have all your documentation in order, like to Willie's point, when they come for your taxes or when you come for the forgiveness letter, have everything in order. Um, even with going for the second round, I had all my paperwork in order. I had everything that they asked for. I gave them, I sent it repeatedly. So it just, uh, it fell through the cracks, if, if, you, if you will, in some senses. But just have everything in order, all your paperwork, your, you want all receipts. Uh, you just want to have a good paper trail and know like, all your information, all your documentation. Get a, if you don't have an accountant or someone, try to get someone on board to help you make sure that you have everything you need, you're bankable, you know, you have a relationship with your bank. I have a great relationship with my bank. It just, you know, some things just, it just happened and it fell through. So with the second round, even the first round, the same entity, it went through smoothly. So um, even though you may be prepared, well prepared, prepare some more because just, just dig deep and find out what else can I have? What else they may ask for? Try to be proactive with it. Put things in order way ahead of time. Put things on your computer or whatever you have to store them. Just make sure you got them stored and you're ready to go. Yeah. Lily. Don said it way better than I could have. I was going to say be persistent and stay in touch with your lender. And she gave it way better than I could have. So we have the same point. Willie. Uh, well, everybody's pretty much said everything, but the only thing I will say is don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, when I found out that one uh, banker was overwhelmed with PPP loans, I went to plan B, uh, went to another bank, you know, that I already had a relationship with. So uh, I know a lot of people in the uh, Facebook group, the support group that we were talking about earlier, you know, they mentioned how one bank, you know, was overloaded. They wouldn't take any more loans. And those people didn't have other bankers to turn to. Uh, so you never want to have all your eggs in one basket. I see it every day where one person, a household may just have one computer. And when that computer goes down, you know, it's catastrophic for, you know, everything that they need to do in the household. So you always want to make sure you have a backup. And then once you get to the point where you can have a backup, have a backup to the backup, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think that's really, really important. And it's also important, I think, for um, folks to talk to people that have had that experience, right? Like, listening to Dawn's experience with PPP um, can help. And so, you know, reaching out and, and really 
connecting to your community and colleagues to see, you know, what did they learn? And, and to be able to take advantage of that is really great. Um, so I have a, another question for you all, and I want each, uh, each of you to answer this question and, and uh, really think about the answer. So this is not the first time Michigan Chronicle has done the Small Business uh, Toolkit Roundtable. And in fact, uh, last year, small business owner Rufus Bartell of Simply Casual made a statement that uh, is really, really uh, appropriate today. And what he said was that this pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities of our community. Um, and we know that just from some of the things we talked about today, the racial equity, uh, you know, the digital divide, the, the gaps, you know, the, all of these things, the, the, the pandemic has really exposed the, the, the vulnerabilities of our community. So I want to hear the views of each of the panelists. What does that mean to you on um, that statement? And do you think that's applicable? And if so, how? And whoever wants to go first can, can do that. Go. I think it's very applicable. Uh, you got to have all of your tools in your toolbox. You know, you think about it, even in my industry, the computer industry, you know, when uh, Best Buy closed down or Micro Center closed down, Amazon wasn't delivering. Where could you go in the community to get the tool that you needed? You know, when Home Depot was not available, do you do you have a relationship with your local uh, uh, hardware store? Uh, could you find toilet paper, soap, you know, groceries, things like that? So you have to think about all of those things, uh, and just be just being in the know, knowing where to get things, who to turn to, uh, resources to access. It's been very helpful uh, to identify those things. Uh, during the pandemic. Really? I would say business. I would say a business plan, Charity. You know, yeah. many of us um, uh, create a business. We have an idea of what we want and how we want to um, to run our business. And sometimes we do it that way. But then have we really planned for, as Mr. Willie said, the contingencies? Oh. The other thing is that it brought out our vulnerabilities and, and I've heard Rufus say this many times is our relationships, you know, with our banking industry. Like Mr. Yeah. Willie said, is if I go across the street to you, Charity, and you say, look, Bernard, you know, I'm booked up. I can't take any more loans. Can I then go and talk to Lily and have that same type of relationship and get things moving? Right. And then the other thing is, are we really prepared for things like escalation of cost and inflation and things of that nature. We, even though we're coming out of COVID, y'all gas prices is back up at $3.10. So how does that affect certain businesses that, 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 that need trucks and things like that? You know, I mean, these are things that we got to plan for. And, and the way I look at planning for a business charity is, is similar to the way we plan for our own home finances, right? Sometimes we got to have an eye on what we can cut back, what we need, like Mr. Willie said, you know, I stocked up on things like the toilet paper and the, the, the bathroom soap and the kitchen soap, you know, Tide, stuff that you need. But prior to this COVID, we we're all just sort of ad hoc when we go to the grocery store or to the CVS. So that those are the kinds of things that, that I think this COVID has exposed in terms of our vulnerabilities. Yeah. Lily or Don? Being what what it has the vulnerabilities are there and they're not as how do I want to say it? Vulnerabilities can be detrimental and they can be good because it pushes you and thrusts you into what you need to get done, where the resources are, how to get to where you need to get to. I'd like to say when a vulnerability for me is being challenged, and I've learned that I can challenge my challenge with a challenge. So knowing how to take that vulnerability and challenge that vulnerability in me, you know, just challenge that vulnerability and how it'll channel me to some things that I need to, to, to go and do and learn and be pro proactive with, it, 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 it provokes your thoughts to next steps, revisiting your business plan, remodifying your business plan, whatever it takes in that vulnerable state to come out of that vulnerability and to thrive and survive, that's what vulnerability can be good for. You know, it, it thrushes you and it forces you to dig deep inside and and just find out what's in you to be able to be an entrepreneur or either you're gonna fold up that tent in that vulnerability or you're gonna 
spring into action with that vulnerability. You're going to challenge that vulnerability situation. So for me, being vulnerable is not a bad word for me. It just makes me, I'm exposed. I need you. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I need you. I need help. So right. it, has a, it, it has its pluses. So that's what I would say to it. Thank you, Don. Uh, Billy. So I guess what, what I'll add to the conversation is the statement about vulnerability brought to mind for me the inequities and inequalities that exist in our society and the way that the pandemic just kind of laid those bare for everyone to look at. And, you know, it's been national news the way that from both a health perspective and an economic perspective, the COVID crisis has not hit everyone evenly. And every one of us can say we've been impacted by COVID in some way, very uniquely. Um, but when you look at the population as a whole, black and brown communities have suffered more, bo both from a health perspective and an economic perspective. And so that's the vulnerability that I am thinking about. Um, and I think that is, to, to what Dawn was saying about taking that vulnerability and turning it into action, I see an opportunity. And I think that's where, for me, Detroit Means Business represents one of those opportunities to see um, our community rally around a need and say, okay, we see this inequity, we see this problem, we now have data to support it, we, we can show that, you know, something we saw and, and we knew to be true anecdotally, we now have data that says black and brown business owners are not receiving, you know, not accessing capital in the same way, we, they're not accessing the assistance that's available in the same way, they don't have the same levels of cash on hand when a crisis hits, and those kinds of things can move um, our entire coalition and our community with some momentum um, towards the solutions to overcome those things so that every business owner can grow their business for whatever reason is important to them, whether it's feeding their family, serving their community, um, achieving their dream. That That's um, the opportunity that I think we have before us um, because of the vulnerability that we're witnessing. And Lily, you know, it's such a great point. You know, um, when you look at the impact of COVID, um, specifically on black and brown communities, uh, the health numbers, um, the death numbers, and the economic indicators. Um, and, and I appreciate that you acknowledge that because it, it is very real. So, so to that to that point, um, you know, my my question is, you know, do we think there are enough resources out there to help the urban, the black, small business, entrepreneurial community? Are there enough resources? Today, no, but that's what we're hoping to rally. And I think that is what that is what this uh, Detroit Means Business Coalition is really all about, is bringing together the private and the public um, to, to, you know, even the playing field and bring more resources to bear. And I'm, I, I do think that what we're seeing now is, is a true movement, a social movement that is um, beyond just talk and, and hopefully we can hold um, the voices that we're hearing accountable to really see the action and the resources come behind the message as well. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else, Bernard or, or Willie or even Don, what? Uh, do we think there are enough resources out there for our urban or black small businesses? No, it's not enough resources. And I'll tell you specifically, me coming from the Detroit Regional Chamber, uh, working with racial justice, and economic equity, I, I, I really think we need organizations that understand the black and brown business. Everybody is not the same, right? We all have uh, different ways of accomplishing things. We have um, different ways of accessing things that are different, different understandings of how the banks work, how, as, as, as Ms. Dawn said, the whole PPP process. We need organizations that can sit down and say, okay, y'all, this is how we're going to get this done. Yep, we know things ain't fair across the board, but we also have the ability to be able to mitigate what ain't fair and be able to get where we need to get to sustain our businesses. Um, and, and one of the things I love about our black and brown entrepreneurs is, again, th that word out of the box, but they're more like the Detroit River, right? With the current Detroit River, you don't know, Charity, if you're going to end up at St. Clair Shores or Zug Island. But our, our businesses are resourceful to hold on keep that praying moving and figure it out. And I think we need more organizations that can help push that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Willie and Dawn, I mean, you guys are black business owners. 
Uh, you know, are there enough resources out there to Bernard's point to understand the unique challenges for black and brown businesses? Um, and if not, what do we do about it? I would say uh, keep the help coming. We can use all the help that we can get. But once we move, you know, out of this phase, we're going to need, you know, to find a way to help black businesses not only survive, but thrive. So, you know, we got to find a way to give them a hand up as well. You know, partner them with, you know, the major corporations and things like that and partner them with other uh, black businesses, black and brown businesses, so that when it comes to being able to apply for the contracts and whatnot, we can team up and tackle those, uh, tackle those things. You know, uh, that would be the next step. You know, I would say more than anything, the networking uh, has been very important also because it's not what you know a lot of the times, it's who you know. And that can mean the difference between your doors being open and your doors being closed. Yeah, that's real. And I, you keep saying Black businesses to thrive and not just survive. And that's one of our taglines at the MDBBA. That's I'm like, are you even on our website? Uh, but yes, that's exactly, it's exactly right. It's, it's why our organization, the Black, Metro Detroit Black Business Alliance exists. And you guys are all right. It's not enough. We need more. We need more. Dawn, your thoughts? That's a question uh, not outside the box, uh, Bernard, thinking outside the box. I think that, they're, they're, first of all, it's not enough, but what we have right now, if it's allocated properly, because some of the things, the barriers that's in the way, the red tape, the line of questions, questions that they have, the num 50 questions for a grant, then they want essays, and then they want, you know, <laughs> this, you know, you so many things that they're asking you for upload yeah. this and upload. How many people don't know how to upload? How many to write an essay right. about? Give us two paragraphs. Give us two hundred words on these are grants that are there. These are funds that are out there, but they have to move that red tape so make it a little more simpler because there is some funds there. That's why I want to say no to uh and. Yes, there is there is a shortage, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Let me put it like that. Yeah, there, there is something that can help that. Yeah. And Charity, okay. you, you know what it reminds me of when folks say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps? First of all, yeah. the boots you gave me didn't have straps and they barely okay. their soles and heels. So let's okay. try to figure out something else to do. You know what I mean? That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And, 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 and that's why uh, to do this work, we need everyone. Every Everybody has a role to play. Uh, when you think about inequity in our country and how it came about, everybody has a role to play. It is not the Black business him, himself or, or herself only that needs to, to uh, help. Do this. Everyone has a role to play. And um, yeah, I'm glad you said that, that Bernard. Um, so 30 seconds or less, we're about to wrap up here, but 30 seconds or less, a final word from all of our panelists. And I want you to speak directly to the small business owner that is watching us today. Um, give them 30 uh, seconds or less words of encouragement, maybe a tip, um, something that's going to help them navigate the next phase. I'll start with you, Lily, then Willie, then Dawn and Bernard, 30 seconds or less. Give um, a tip, a tool, a word of encouragement to the small business owner that's watching. Go ahead, Lily. So I'm definitely going to go with words of encouragement. I just want to say thank you to the business owners in the community because the, your presence is providing services, goods, employment. Um, you are occupying a building in a neighborhood that's helping our community to thrive. So stick with it. Please reach out if you need anything. DetroitMeansBusiness.org. Reach out to your district business liaison through the DEGC. We really want to support you because you're a cornerstone of our city's success. All right. My uh, point is, you know, my point of advice would probably be focus on your customer, make them happy, uh, go after those sales because those are the ones that's going to keep you in business. And as uh, one of my mentors once said, focus on your ABC, always be closing. Awesome. Don, go ahead. I just want to say stay encouraged. Stay focused, stay informed, 
and just it's, it's work, but you can do the work because you are an entrepreneur. So just reach in and and just fight, fight the good fight, and continue, and be there for your clients, and they'll be there for you. Thank you, Don Bernard. Hey, so always remember to our small businesses, your three resources that you cannot live without money, people, and time. And you have to figure out in the equation where all this fits. Don't be afraid to research, read, surround yourself with uh, like folk who are trying to go somewhere, do some things, um, be innovative, right? Don't be afraid to take a, take a look at your business plan and kind of retool yourself and do some things different. Don't be afraid to ask questions. There's so many of us out here that have done and are willing to help. And then lastly, keep that prayer because black folk, y'all know if we don't pray, things ain't going to happen. So Charity, I want to thank you. I want to thank the Michigan Chronicle. I want to thank my colleagues on the panel. This has really been a blast. Thank you. Thanks, Bernard. And um, so I just want to, you know, my final words are, you know, thanks to all the panelists and the, and the viewers um, for watching. Uh, you know, we want you to be sure to visit michiganchronicle.com slash small business for more small business information and resources. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm with the Metro Detroit Black Business Alliance, mdbva.com, and we are so excited to be here with our partners. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the, the Michigan Chronicle Small Business Toolkit. Uh, and the presenting partners, the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, Detroit Means Business, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, Detroit Regional Chamber, and our supporting partner, Flagstar Bank. And so we want you to mark your calendars for Thursday, June 24th at 2 p.m. We are going to do roundtable number two, and it's small business and COVID-19 a year later, providing tools and resource information to help businesses in their growth strategies thrive during the COVID-19 pandemic, and that'll be presented by Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Thank you again for spending time with us this afternoon, and have a great day. <laughs>